All right, everyone, welcome to day three of the 21 convention, the men's conference of the century. Now everyone's all set. This is the very first speech of day three, and we're getting right into things. Uh, it will help wake you up, this next man that's coming to the stage. He is going to help you turn up the volume on your communication. Please welcome your charisma coach, Marcus Oki. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. 21 convention. I'm still trying to work out why it's a 21 convention. I was thinking maybe it's because it's in the Fibonacci sequence of numbers. You know, you've got 21, and then maybe that's, maybe the 21 convention is everything you wish you'd known when you were 21. I'm glad we did it at 21 and not 55, because <laughs> that would be not as good. Don't squat with so much weight. My knees are killing me. I wish I'd known that. Or what's the next number? 89. Why, yes, taking my false teeth out does have more than one use. <laughs> but here we are, 21 convention. Everything I'm going to tell you now is all the stuff I wish I'd known when I was 21. And what better way to start the day off than breakfast? See, for me, I teach charisma. And people don't really understand, what is charisma? What, what's it all about? Well, my definition is it's the ability to affect the emotions of the people you speak to in a way that wouldn't have been felt had you not been there in the first place. So in other words, it's making people feel an emotion. Now, hopefully, this breakfast that I brought to the table might be able to demonstrate that. So quick question for you. What is this? Orange. It's an orange. OK. This is yours in one moment, sir. Thank you for stepping up. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. <laughs> it gets better. Um, so if we squeeze this orange, what comes out? Orange juice. Orange juice. Why? Because it's an orange, yeah, full of vitamin C goodness. Orange juice comes out an orange. Just like when you speak to people, the emotion that comes out of you tells them what's going on. Now, if I squeeze this and put it in a glass on the table, I'm pretty sure anyone watching could say, I'm reasonably confident that's orange juice in that glass. Would you agree? Maybe a few people might say, well, hang on, maybe it's mango juice. But the majority of us would think, yep, orange juice comes out of the orange. That looks like orange juice. And the emotions coming out of you as you talk to people tell people what's going on. Because we know that juice has come out of the orange. Oh, almost got his head. We know the juice is coming out of the orange is from an orange. So whatever emotions coming out of us tells people what's going on inside of us as we speak to them. It's kind of like um, almost a telltale sign. So the ability to change the emotions of the people you speak to is everything. You can talk to people with no emotion, and they will not feel an emotion either. Or you can talk to people with lots of emotion, and maybe they will feel that emotion. If I want somebody to feel an emotion, the very best chance I've got of doing that, not the only chance, but the very best chance, I think, it's to fill the emotion first myself. In other words, it's to go first. It's to fill that emotion, and hopefully it'll come out and affect them. So if we look back at the charismatic leaders throughout history, people say, you know, you teach charisma. What about Hitler? I have to confront that. Hitler was a very charismatic guy, very charming. You see. The thing is, two worlds exist. There's the world around you, and there's the world inside your mind. Two different worlds. And the world around you can affect what goes on in your mind, and your mind can affect the world around you. So if you take a look at the room at the moment, find something in the room you're in, whatever you're looking at was probably designed by somebody. It probably started off as an idea in their head and was brought out of their mind into the world. Does that make sense? Yeah. So all the great bridges, space stations, space rockets, even that glass on the table started as an idea. And someone took action and made it real. So the emotions that are in your mind also get transmitted into the world around you. Hitler's ideas became part of the world around us. 
Now his idea started, I'm sure, in his, in his own mind, as very positive. You know, I'm going to make Europe a utopia. The trouble is, he was a nutcase. And he didn't make Europe a, a utopia. In his mind he did, he projected it out into the world. But unfortunately, it affected everyone else in the world as well. And this is the point I'm trying to make here. What we put out into the world affects other people. What other people put out into the world affects you. So for me, everyone watching this, you're the world around me. Just as to you, I'm the world around you. It's the people that have control of what's going on in their own mind that are able to put emotion out there and change the world around them stronger than others. What I mean by this is if I talk to somebody and I make them feel an emotion, I'm changing how they feel about themselves, as you all do when you talk to people. If you're happy and you talk to somebody and you put them in a really good mood, you make them feel a nice way. And that affects their thought process. And that thought process being changed affects their mind. I remember when I was younger thinking, wouldn't it be cool to be in control of people's minds? You know, I was a kid, I was power crazy. But we do it to each other all the time. All of us affect the, the emotions of the people we speak to. So it's just about learning how to do that. So I'm going to start by maybe saying a bit controversial. For my, my two cents, uh, I've worked in the self-development industry for a while now. And for me, time and time again, I strongly believe now, confidence is bullshit. Absolute bullshit. Now this is just my opinion. And everything I say to you is biased. It's just what I've experienced. Because you are your own best teachers. Not me, not anyone else who gets up on this stage and talks to you. You have to figure things out for yourself. And this is just what I figured out. Hopefully, it'll cut down some of the learning time for you guys. Some of it, you may completely disagree with. Fine. Some of it, hopefully, you'll agree with. Great. But it's just my two cents. So the reason I say confidence is bullshit is this. Confidence only really works when you're having success. Now, I teach people to become better communicators. I wanted to do that because I always had that problem. I was very shy when I was younger. I couldn't get up on the stage and speak. I'd absolutely poo myself. And, uh, and I took strides to improve that. Now, the one thing I found is people were saying, well, how can we learn to, you know, what do we, I always run out of things to say. That was the thing I always heard. And I thought, well, you know what? Maybe I can fix that. So on my website, yourcharismacoach.com, I made a book. And this book told people how to get brilliant conversations. If you like, download it, check it out, it's free. And it had some good techniques. For example, conversations always die when you don't move the conversation into the past or the future. If your conversation is in the present moment, it's game over, it will die. So what I mean by that is if you see somebody looking at a painting, and you say, hey, that's a really nice painting. The person agrees with you and says, yeah, it's really nice. If that conversation doesn't move into the past or the future, it's dead and you just stand there going, why did I even talk? I shouldn't have done that. But if we say, that's a really nice painting, hey, I've got an idea. You've got a big jacket. If we fit it in there, I'll meet you outside, we'll sell it on eBay and divide the profits. I've moved the conversation to the future. Of course, I've made it up and it's fun, but it's gone somewhere. Or if I look at the painting and say, damn, I bet that painting took ages to paint. No wonder he cut off his ear. It's moved it into the past. Doesn't have to make sense but it's moved it somewhere. So conversations have to have direction. Now that's a very nice technique, but it's bullshit unless something deeper is taken care of first. And that is your emotion. Because, in fact, let's do a little test. If you can, uh, we'll take your middle finger. Okay, and I want you to put it down and all the other fingers up. And really kind of, you know, lock it behind there. I'm going to demonstrate on this book. I want you to press it down like this. OK, we're going to do a little test. Raise your thumb if you found talking to more people on your quest for self-development has made you more, more refined as a conversationalist, maybe. It's improved your skills a little bit. OK, cool. 
Next question. As you've spoken to people and you've maybe practiced, raise your little finger if you've had conversations that are fun. Definitely me. I've had a lot of fun conversations. All right. Almost there. When talking to people, I want you to raise your index finger if you've ever shared a good story with a stranger. Yeah, I've done that. And lastly, if you've ever gotten over your anxiety of starting conversations up with people you've never met before, raise your ring finger. <laughs> ah, got a bit of a problem there. Well, I couldn't raise my ring finger, so that means I've still got it. I've still got that anxiety of talking to people. But hang on a minute. I've been doing self-improvement, or the, I've been in this industry for years. Why have I still got it? The answer is because I'm human. You're born with a suite of emotions, and they're great. Anger, happiness, embarrassment, jealousy, even the bad ones that we kind of try and hide. You're human. That's the point of being human. Rather than trying to block those emotions out, rather than trying to build the confidence to overcome them. It's not about that. It's about enjoying those emotions when you experience them. Because in eight years, I've never seen one confidence course that works. Now, maybe I haven't seen enough confidence courses, but I meet people that have been on them, and they get to the end, and they say, yep, that's me. I'm fixed. And about two weeks later, after they finish feeling good, they're crap again. They're not right or they have a spate of feeling really confident for a while, and after six months, for some reason, it just dies. Maybe they had an off day, maybe they spoke to some people and it didn't really work out too well, and their confidence goes. That's because confidence relies on success to work. You have to have a good result, a good result, a good result. If I get a bad result enough times in a row, my confidence is gonna be shot. Now here's the problem. Do you remember what I said about the world around us and the world inside our mind? Can you think of anybody you know who doesn't have at least one little problem they're working through in their life? That their life is absolutely peachy in every way. There's just nothing wrong. I can't think of anyone. The one thing I have learned, and I wish I did know when I was 21, is all the stuff that happens to you in your life, all the bullshit, just gets replaced with new bullshit. You never ever really fix the bullshit problem. You never ever really fix uh, you know, the, the stuff that comes in. It just gets changed, it just gets replaced. And it's that kind of uh, the bullshit when it happens, it's how you deal with it that determines who you're gonna become as a person. And you're always being tested like that. It's great, it probably just doesn't feel that way right now. So all those people have all got some sort of problem they're working on. I will never look to those people to pat my back for me. I'll never look to my audience to pat my back for me. I never look to anyone I meet to pat my back for me because I have no control over how they think or feel about me. I have good intentions, but I have no control. What I mean by that is a story from my father. He was a salesman back in the day and he would sell machinery and all the other salesmen got together one day and they were talking and he said, what's going on? And they were talking about this one prospect who was a complete hard ass, who nobody could sell to. And he said, you know what, I want to have a go. And they said, no, don't. They tried to warn him. They said, he will just tell you to get lost. So I'm proud to say my dad being my dad, he gave it a shot. He turned up, knocked on the door, and the guy told him to get lost straight away. He said, oh, okay. He goes, I'm just going to go. But before I do, what's the matter? He said, the matter is, you're in my office. You're going to go out the window if you're not careful. My dad said, well, look, I'm leaving anyway. But I've really got to know what's up. Again, the guy told him to get lost. But my dad persisted, and he said, look, I'm going anyway, either by the window or by the stairs. I'm going to probably end up in a sling. But what's up? And the guy told him that a relative of his was very sick in hospital and about to die any day. So no wonder this guy was angry. No wonder this guy was upset. And all the other salesmen just thought he was an asshole. Maybe he was at that moment but there was all that other stuff going on in his life at the time. My dad had no control over that. No one does. The people you talk to, you have no control what's going on in their life. So for that reason, why base how you feel about yourself on somebody else's opinion? If 
I hold up my hand like this, you guys see my palm. Is that correct? I too see that as well, I guess. But you see from this angle, and I see from this angle. We both see the same hand, but our perspectives are different. Our perspectives change our perception of things. Imagine you're driving along, and uh, you hear the familiar sirens of an ambulance behind you. It comes right up behind you, and you think, OK, I've got to move. So you move out the way, and all the other cars move out the way as well, and they let the ambulance go by. And right behind that ambulance is a Ferrari, right up the back of the ambulance. It's used that gap that you've made. What do you think about the driver? Any ideas? Arrogant, yeah. Me too, when I first heard that. But we don't know if that driver is chasing that ambulance because his wife's dying or been involved in an accident. We don't know anything. So whatever we project onto stuff that happens in the world around us determines how we look at life. And we don't know shit. So there's two types of people in life. We we'll call them bananas. In fact, let me ask you, if I want to find out which banana is the biggest, what do I do? Pardon? Measure. measure them. How would I measure them? What's a really quick way? If I, if I held them out like that, would that work? <laughs> what about if I put them close together? That would probably tell me which is the biggest. Would that be right? OK. And it looks like this one's the biggest. Here you go. I just realized, throwing a banana, it may come back to me. They're kind of boomerang shaped. <laughs> Here you go. People are sometimes like bananas, and I'll explain why. In life, we look for other people to see where we fit in the scheme of things. And the reason is, we all have a sense of belonging. We want to know where we fit into the fabric of society. And we get that by looking at every other person and looking at how they react to us, to tell us if we're cool, if we're not cool. In fact, let's replace the bananas with diamonds. Some diamonds think, hang on a minute, am I a big diamond, am I a small diamond? Have I got a crack down me? How do I compare to all the other diamonds? And they say, oh, OK, I'm a little diamond, right. That's one type of people. The other type just know they're diamonds. And people go, hey, you a big diamond or a small diamond? They just go, I'm a diamond. Yeah, but are you massive or? I'm a diamond. In other words, what I'm trying to say is they know who they are. They understand who they are. They're not looking for everyone else to react to them, to say certain things to them, to see where they fit in the scheme of things. So that's the start of sorting out what's going in there. Because when you sort out what's going on there, the emotions you project will be different. And that's what affects other people. Hitler wouldn't have been able to have risen to the level of power he had had he not been really likable. If he was an arsehole, which he's known for being, he wouldn't have had that success. It was his ability to instill that emotion in people. Now, if you imagine, if you turn up in a Ferrari and a girl sees you driving a Ferrari, that might make her feel an emotion. She might be very attracted to you. But what if it's Enzo Ferrari's great-granddaughter who was born and raised around Ferraris? Is she going to feel the same sort of emotion? Chances are she's probably not. Our ability to change everyone else's emotions is more consistent than the Ferrari. So the world around you is chaos. You've got no control of that. You've got no control of what people are thinking. You've got no control of how they're handling stuff. What you do have control over is your reaction to it. The only thing you have 100% control over in your life is how you react to things. So when I'm in a situation, I'm always thinking whether that's a conversation, whether that's an interaction, whether that's doing something crazy, I'm always thinking, how can I make this fun? How can I take happiness from this? And the secret is to play. In 1913, Eleanor H. Porter wrote a book called Pollyanna. And the point of that book was, was as a little girl, and her life was all about being grateful for everything that happened to her. Now, in the story, all she wants for Christmas is a dolly. Someone screwed up, and she got crutches. 
Now that would be okay if her legs were broken, but they weren't. So she took the crutches and she looked at her dad and her dad in the story is like, oh my God, this, this ain't very good. And she says, you know what? I'm really grateful because I don't need them. So she chose to react awesomely. Every situation is just a perspective. Anything that happens to you from one angle could be rubbish. From another angle could be the best thing ever. But it's your perspective that determines everything. And the way you get that perspective is habit. So when I talk to people, I always have lots of energy. I'm always playing. And whenever I go into a conversation, I always think this is either going to go really well or it's going to be really fun. The reason is because it always is when I look for it. If I walk into a conversation thinking, this is going to go really well, it's going to be a bit rubbish, I'll get one of those responses. If you've ever done an exam at school, or you've done your driving test, I, you know, I, my driving test was terrible. I remember getting in the car, sitting there, and thinking, any second now I'm going to fail. It was just like this guy with a clipboard just looking at me, and I was like, oh my god, if I get this wrong, I've screwed. For me, it was a black and white result, one or zero. I could either succeed or I could fail. My advice is get rid of the fail box, cross it out, and just write really funny story, because you'll find it. A friend of mine has 100% consistency in talking to people. Now, what I mean by that is he always has a good result. And I said, how did you get that success? And he said, because every conversation I ha I've had has always gone really well. And I thought, well, I'm a charisma coach. Not every conversation I have goes really well. I screw up all the time. So what's he doing? So I studied and I looked. And I found out the only thing he was doing was he was just taking every conversation he had and just thinking, that went well, that went funny, that went great, that went funny. And it built up 100% consistency. So he knew that every conversation he was going to go into was going to go well, it was going to be funny, it was going to be awesome. There was no other reaction. There was no other result. We've forgotten how to play. We grow up and we lose our playful edge. When we're kids, we problem solve by playing, by having fun. Remember all that stuff you learned at school when you're in the first few years of school? How to talk, how to read, all the important stuff. You know, the basics of maths, the stuff that lasts you your lifetime. You did it through playing. And then when you get to adult school, all the play goes out the window. It gets replaced with logic. About the age of 12 or 13, you join senior school. And you don't play games in the playground anymore. You play adult games. And you look to people how to act. Because I remember my first day at school, I didn't play you know, tag and running around. I was looking at other people thinking, OK, I play football now because that's the dumb thing. And if I don't, I'm going to stick out like a sore thumb. School raises you to be a logical thinker. It takes away from your playful, creative side and moves you to a logical side. And that's great, because you need to be logical to problem solve. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to do business. You wouldn't be able to work. Let's say you were building a room like this. And you're putting the last brick on. And uh, you say, oh, you know, are we finished yet? What's the time? And the other builder goes, it's half past your mum. You know, I don't know, is, that gonna affect, is it going to be built? If, or if you order some bricks, and you say, right, we need 50 bricks. Um, and I go, ask you, how many bricks do you need? You say, uh, a billion. <laughs> this place ain't getting built. It's going to be really huge. So you need logic to function in the world. The trouble is we forget to be playful. But it's when we're being playful that we're at our most emotive, that we're connecting with people in the most engaging way, when we're having fun. People ask me, how do I start conversations up with strangers? Sometimes I walk up to them and talk uh, about something I've seen. But more often than not, it's having fun. I was in a coffee shop two days ago. And I was in the line, and uh, there was a girl, and she was buying some, some coffee, some tea, whatnot. And uh, my client said, how would you talk to her? And I thought, I, well, I said to him, I said, look, what's fun? And he said, I don't know. So I looked at the situation. She just opened her bag, and I thought, this will be fun. I took out a brownie and just stuck it in her bag and went, oh my God, I can't believe you're stealing that. That's, and she went, she had an accent from Canada or somewhere. She's like, oh my God, what have you done? Uh, I'm sorry if Can Canadians don't talk about that. But I said, look, I said, you come over here, right? You think it's one rule for you and one for the natives who live here. And we she laughed and she punched me in the arm and we had a conversation and it was fun. So if I want to start a conversation with a random person, I'll see how I can make it fun for myself how I can be you know, amused by it, because I always will find that. It's more fun to start a conversation up with somebody in a supermarket, not by going, 
wow, that looks like you've got a lot you're going to cook tonight. It's more fun just to throw a banana in their shopping basket. You know, just random banana throw a person. Or, as I like to do, take your basket, walk up to their basket, go, I don't want to be weird or anything, but, uh, and then just take something out of the basket and put it in your basket. <laughs> <laughs> now, you have to laugh afterwards. A client of mine did that and went, and ran off. She was like, come back here. <laughs> she did feel an emotion, though. But that's what I'm getting at. If you can make people feel emotions, you're different from every other person in the room. You get those emotions by feeling them first yourself. Now, here's why confidence is bullshit. Because I have no control of how people are going to react to me. The only control I have is how I react to them. It's not about their reaction to me. It's about my reaction to their reaction of me. And my reaction is always going to be freaking awesome. You know, the other day, I was uh, a friend of mine. He said, listen, I need some help. Can you put up some shelving? Now, I know I'm a charisma coach, and I'm talking about shelving. Bear with me. I said, yeah, fine. I'll do that shelving job for you. And I got his shelves, and I took them out of the paper, and I was shocked. They were glass. They were wire. Pro possibly some UFO technology in there as well. I just didn't know what to do with it. Now, what I didn't tell him is I'd never put up shelves before. And this thing was monstrosity. But I thought, OK, I'll give it a go, because I'm reveling in the challenge. Play is all about finding something that's a challenge and knowing you've got the skill to do it. Now, rather than knowing I had the skill to put up this shelf, because I'd never put up a shelf before, I just assumed it would be all right. It would be fun. So I was drilling my little holes. I put my shelf up. And I tell you what, it looked really good. On the way home that night, I must admit, I won't lie, I was sitting on the train and I was having a little, little sort of dream about, oh, those shelves I put up were great, and I was thinking about them. And I thought to myself, if I did that again, how would I put the shelves up differently? And I thought, oh, I would drill the holes slightly closer together so the shelves just sat in some sort of harmony rather than being a little bit skew with. He never knew they were the first shelves I put up. Sucks to be him. And I realised that's the secret of all skill. All natural skill that you build doesn't come from you reading it in a book. It comes from you taking action. And it comes from you after every, uh, every challenge you take on, whether that's talking to somebody you've never met before, whether it's picking up a, a tennis ball and hitting it across a net, something I've never been able to do. But when you get good at anything, it's because you come away from every challenge and you think, what went really well then? And you revel in it. And what could I do better next time? What could I do better to improve? The reason you ask that question is because you want to improve. I wanted to put my shelves up better. I'll tell you what, I had a bit of a, bit of a fetish going on because I, I want to put up shelves all the time now. I'm enjoying it so much. But yet many people I talk to hate the fact or hate the, the feeling of going to talk to strangers. Hate it so much. It's because they look at it as a challenge that they don't have the skill for. Results are bullshit. Confidence is bullshit. My favorite word is bullshit. When we go and talk to somebody, if we have an expectation of what's going to happen, if I had an expectation those shelves were going to be brilliant, I would have been screwing because I, they weren't going, they didn't go great. I was drilling holes in all the wrong places. Um, there was dust all over my face. It was just a mess. But if, and, you know, the image on the box, like you sort of look at the box, you think, that looks good. And then you lower it and then the shelves all like, that would have put me off. I would have given up because I had that expectation that everything was going to go well. Lose the expectations. When you played as a kid, you didn't have expectations. You just enjoyed reveling in the challenge. You enjoyed the skill. You enjoyed taking the risk. So when I talk to people, I don't look for the end result. The end result means nothing. Because I could go and talk to somebody, and they could smile, and they could laugh, and I could come away thinking, wow, I did a good job there. Or I could go and smile and talk to somebody and they could scowl and I go, wow, I did bad there. It doesn't matter. We don't know what sort of day they've been having. I can't base that on who I am as a person. So what it really comes down to is taking action. Action is everything. There's, uh, I think Friedman said, um, an ounce of action is worth a ton of theory. And he's completely right. Here's why. Say I want to think to myself, I'm the greatest conversationist alive. 
life will listen to me saying that, and it will come down on its little cloud and, see, and say to me, right, you said you're the greatest conversationist alive. Let's see how good you are now. And it would put me in positions where I've got to have conversations with people. I might be on the tube, I might be on the subway, I might be in the line at the coffee shop. Life's putting all these opportunities for me to talk to people. If I step up and I take the conversation and I do it, and I open my mouth and I go, oh, hi, I've taken action. Even though it could have done, been done better, yes, it could. But I took the action. And the action gives me a link of chain. Every time I take action, I get another link of chain. Every time I don't take action, chain breaks. Don't break the chain. So what you need to do is find something you want, whether it's be to be the best soccer player, whether it's to be able to squat 100 kilograms, whether it's to just have a conversation with that girl in the coffee shop. Whatever it is, life will hear you when you want it, and it will put you in a position when you can take action. The result is meaningless. Sometimes you'll get a result that you enjoy. You know, that girl might smile, or she might give you her number. You might lift 100 kilograms. That's great. The world patted you on the back then. And that's nice when that happens. But that's not consistent. You can always pat your own back. Always. That's what keeps you feeling good. That's what keeps you feeling happy. And when you're feeling that kind of happiness, that's what comes out when you talk to people. Because it's the emotions you make them feel. My thought is this. The homework I want to give you, oh, homework, or the plan of action I would give you, is find something that you can play with. Oh, that sounds a bit rude. No. Because <laughs> we can all do that. No, what I was going to say is the next time you're out in a situation, and it could be out of this room, it could be on the train home tonight, it could be in the bar tonight, it could be anywhere, look for... Look, look at the room and think, what could I do that's fun here? What would make me laugh? What would make you laugh? It's not about making other people laugh. It's about making you smile and do it. So uh, for me, it's being on a train and, uh, and realizing I've got a bottle of vodka in my pocket, but I've put water in it. And I'm thinking, OK, this will be fun to see if I can empty this entire train carriage. Unscrew the bottle, say, OK. Look around. I drink the vodka and put my hands over my eyes and go, oh. Two people get up and leave. Good, good. <laughs> this is good so far. Thinking, OK. And behind my face, I'm like, how can I, how can I get them all to leave? Start crying. <laughs> Fall over the person next to you. It's just harmless. My, my record is five minutes. So I urge you to give it a go and beat it. <laughs> you see, it's not about confidence. Confidence is bullshit. It's about not giving a damn. Now, if I could express that, and we're lucky we've got video here. You can't express this in a book. But not giving a damn really comes down to this. It's like, hey, we should go and talk to those people. And your reaction is, meh. It's just a feeling of, meh. If you get a good result, Great. If you get a bad result, meh. It's not about going, yeah, this is going to go amazing. It's bullshit. It's about walking up and just dealing with what happens. And whatever does happen, know that you can deal with it and make it happy. Because life's going to throw you that stuff. The world around you is going to throw stuff towards you, to emotions towards you. You've got to grab them, take them, and be able to laugh at them and throw them back. Uh, a good friend of mine, is the next speaker, a guy called Sasha. He taught me a very good one. Uh, in the coffee shop, look for somebody who's about to take a sandwich. What you do is you walk up, not giving a damn. And as they lean for their sandwich, and they reach towards it, do your best Bruce Lee impression. <laughs> and grab the sandwich. They will feel shock. They will be the most terrifying sandwich they have ever grabbed <laughs> in their entire life. And they'll be in shock. And you talk to them straight away and you say, do you know what? 
That's the most terrifying sandwich you'll ever, ever buy. But it's good news, because every sandwich you now buy will be a luxury. The food will taste better. It will be brilliant. And they're like, uh, uh, uh. That's extreme, but you're making them feel an emotion. You're different from every other person in the room. So for me, charisma, it's just communicating with emotion. Now, there's ways to do that. It's all about your belief. It's knowing who you are. That's the ultimate question. Who the heck are you? And even then, the answer isn't something you'd maybe have with words. I could say my belief in myself, who I am, is just that I'm cool or I'm awesome. It could be. But really, do I even have to say that? It's just about knowing. I'm not going to look for evidence around me, though, because the world is a chaotic place. Just as I looked at my hand, and you see this perspective and I see this perspective, everything that happens when I talk to people, however I look at it, determines what evidence I take from it. So whatever our belief is in ourself, it needs evidence to exist. If we don't have that evidence, you know, if you've ever looked in the mirror and said, well, I'm cool and awesome, and then three weeks later, <laughs> you're not feeling cool and awesome, it's because you've got no evidence for it. But it, the world is too chaotic to get the evidence, I think. It's great when it happens and you get that great run and you talk to everyone and they love you and it's brilliant. But it's not always going to happen. You're going to have those bad spells as well. So it's up to you to create the evidence for yourself by how you interpret the world when it occurs. So I guess what I'm trying to say is this. You're your own best teacher. The reason you're, you're your own best teacher is the stuff that you find out, the problems that you encounter, when you find out the solution to them, you own that knowledge. Everything I found out, I've had to find out pretty much firsthand. But it becomes part of me because of that. In doing so, in finding what it is, uh, the, the solutions to your problems, in being your own best teacher, um, you become congruent with it. You own that knowledge, and that's what causes the change in you. That's what causes us to all develop. Life is about learning and growing. So all the play that I ever do, I learn from it and I grow from it. And I always enjoy it. Conversations for me aren't stressy. They aren't horrible. Anxiety occurs. I still get it. I love it. But rather than trying to blast through it, why would I do that? I'd rather just get addicted to it. So that's exactly what I do. If I feel that uncomfortable feeling in my tummy, I'm like, awesome. I'm going to revel in it. I'm going to turn the volume up in it. I'm going to make it even worse. So when I'm drinking that bottle of vodka on the train, that's making my tummy go even worse. That's making my toes curl. Um, it's the people that are self-amused that have the most fun. The risk is, though, the fear of looking insane. Because you think, OK, if I act like a kid again, if I'm playful, if I slide down banisters, if I start enjoying myself, what are other people going to think? Doesn't matter what they think. Whatever anyone thinks is bullshit. It's what you think. So I'm going to open the floor to questions. You've been a, um, a great audience. Uh, any questions? Yes, sir. What's the orange? The orange is, were you listening? The orange is uh, your breakfast. Well, what the orange symbolizes is the juice that comes out the orange. Yeah. And you, you have emotions, right? But an orange is an orange. You can be whatever fruit you want to be. That sounds a bit kinky. OK, what's the difference between charisma and enthusiasm? Uh, I think enthusiasm is reveling in the challenge and thinking you're going to apply your skill to something. Uh, you can be enthusiastic putting up a shelf. You can be enthusiastic digging a hole. Charisma is about interacting with people, uh, about being emotionally contagious. Now, enthusiasm does create emotions in yourself, and they do rub off. Um, but for me, my, my overall look at charisma is, well, there's actually seven parts. It's not always convenient, always seven. But it's your belief, your attitude to life, uh, your spontaneity, that's not running out of things to say, 
your charm, which is how you make people feel in your presence, your actual presence, um, also your ability to connect to people, and lastly, your conversation skills in terms of rhetoric, so your ability to influence as you speak. So I hope that helps. So for me, enthusiasm is more about if you're going to jump into something. So if I see that situation where, oh, God, there's somebody I can go and talk to. Yep, let's give it a go. Uh, of course, that's going to carry off some emotion uh, as I go in. Yes, sir. Okay, excellent question. So you're, you're saying, how can you start getting evidence for yourself that you're awesome rather than waiting for the world to tell you that you're awesome? It, again, it comes down to how you look at the world. If you want to do it straight away, it's, it's looking for the best in everything. Um, so in the situation I gave in the talk where the Ferrari's pulling along, our perspective generally is, who's this guy who's just cut in front of everyone and now he's using the space of the ambulance? But if we can be objective and say, well, you know what, from another perspective, it could be that that guy's just in a mad rush and um, you know, there's no problem at all. So a way I look at it is this. Um, negative emotions are great. Everyone says, oh, be positive. Yeah, positive emotions are awesome as well, but you're born with negative emotions for a reason. For starters, it's where all humor comes from. You know, if we had no negative emotions, comedy would be boring as. The trick, though, is to turn the negative stuff when it happens into a positive. So the way I love doing that is playing that game from the Pollyanna book. It's just thinking, that's great because, um, for example, I step outside and it starts pouring with rain. Ah, oh, that's great. I could do with a shower. I haven't had one for a few days. Or let's say something more extreme happens. Let's say I'm unfortunate enough to get my leg blown off. Could happen. Um, hopefully not on this stage. It would be a bit of a death trap if it would. But let's say I lose my leg, and I hope I, I hope I do keep it. But if it disappears, oh well, at least my trousers last twice as long now. Or do you know what? I'm going to have the most convincing pirate impression you've ever seen. <laughs> now I just need to lose this for a hook. So it's how I interpret the world that keeps me upbeat and happy. It's nice when the world pats us on the back. Uh, you know it is. But that's all fickle. We can have a really nice sports car, but then that can be taken away from us. We can have lots of money in the bank, and that can disappear. The only thing you have any consistency over is your reaction. So focus on how you're reacting to the world when it gives you stim stimulus. You know the world is affecting you, and the world around you is affecting you, when you feel an emotion to something. So if you're stuck in traffic and you feel an emotion, that's the world around you affecting you. When you feel that emotion, how are you going to deal with it? How are you going to make that emotion as happy as possible? Can you turn it into a game? Can it be fun? Can it be like, ah, oh, do you know what? I'm late for this meeting, but check me out, doing my own thing, turning up the radio. Or you can just go, oh my god, I'm going to be late for this meeting. There's nothing you can do about it. All fear exists in the future, stuff that hasn't happened yet. All sadness exists in the past. And all happiness exists right now in this moment. And that's the only thing you own, is just the moment. Being aware of everything that's going on and enjoying every damn minute of it. You'll know if you can do that or not, if you can enjoy the moment. Go somewhere that's completely boring. Go to a room with four white walls and sit in there. And if you can be happy on your own in that room, then you've cracked it, you've mastered it. Now that I think about it, a lot of insane people get put in four walls. <laughs> Wait a minute, there's a bit of a correlation. Yes? Yes, um, my question is, what about the sort of classic charismatic bad boy type? Hi there, what about the, uh, the classic kind of uh, charismatic bad boy type character uh, with, you know, uh, sort of being and reactive and that kind of thing? Sure. Um, if you're that sort of persona, if you're a bit of a bird boy, uh, is that person, first of all, two questions, is that person making the person he's speaking to feel an emotion? And two, is he dealing with the emotions as they, come, as they come towards him? And I think the answer in both cases is yes. So, for example, he knows who he is in the world, doesn't give a damn, is just himself, 
My intention is to always try and leave people better off than you meet them. But, you know, he goes in, chats to somebody, gives the girl butterflies maybe, and then, um, you know, she gives him a slap, I don't know. She's just unreactive to it. So he's deciding how he's going to filter the emotions when they get given to him. Yes, sir. You mentioned your book earlier on. What's it called and where can you get it from? Okay. Uh, I'm a terrible marketer, so if I was better, I'd be selling that and going, and you can buy my 89 DVD uh, set. But um, my book is free, and it's from my website, yourcharismacoach.com. And that will tell you all the techniques that I used to become a better conversationalist. But the emotions are everything. Conversation and the ability to talk to people, it's a bit like a water slide. The flume allows the water to go down the slide, right? And that's the conversation. The water itself is the emotion. If you've got a slide with no water, you get a really sore bum. Or if you've got the water and no slide, that's called a waterfall. So the ability to connect to people, you need the conversation to a point because it allows you that, that channel of communication. But the emotion you then put down it is everything. Feel that emotion yourself first. So, guys. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much.